PC recording? PC recording is underway. Okay. Um, Up is rolling. Give me a second, uh, Chair Shaw. Yep. <clears throat> Good evening. Welcome to the remote hearing of the New York City Advisory Commission on Property Tax Reform. Everyone, please turn on your videos at this time. Silence all electronic devices. All written testimony can be submitted by going to nyc.gov slash property tax reform. Again, that is nyc.gov slash property tax reform. Thank you. Chair Shaw, we're ready to start, sir. Right. Thank you, Sergeant. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark Shaw, the chair of the New York City Advisory Commission on Property Tax Reform and a senior advisor at the um, CUNY Institute for State and Local Governance. Today's Zoom hearing is the second of five borough-based hearings on the preliminary report of the Advisory Commission. Virtual hearings are scheduled for Queens on June 9th, the Bronx on June 14th, and Manhattan on June 16th. All hearings will begin at 6 p.m. A Staten Island hearing already occurred on May 11th. If you are unable to attend your borough's hearing, please know that members of the public may attend any hearing regardless of their home borough. As a reminder, all people wishing to testify must register on the Advisory Commission's website at least 24 hours prior to the start of the hearings. Also, for members of the public who are listening who would like to submit written testimony, they may do so at any time. Um, at nyc.gov slash property tax reform slash testimony. 60 people have signed up to testify tonight and 49 Brooklyn residents um, have submitted written testimony. Before we begin with the public testimony, I wanna say thank you to all the members of the public who submitted written testimony, as well as those here tonight who are taking the time out of their schedules to testify in the Advisory Commission's preliminary report. We value what each of you has to say, so please know that even if we don't directly respond to your testimony today, we do hear you and your testimony will be part of our deliberations. With over 60 people registered to testify tonight, it's in the interest of time that we cannot respond individually. I'm just now going to um, review where we are right now. In, in January 2020, the commission released 10 preliminary recommendations to reform the property tax system. Hearings were initially planned to begin on March 2020, but delayed due to COVID. We request that the public testimony specifically respond to the commission's 10 recommendations. I will now read the commission's 10 preliminary recommendations. One, the commission recommends moving co-ops, condos, and rental buildings with up to 10 units into a new residential class along with one to three family homes. The property tax system will continue to cons consist of four classes of property, residential, large rentals, utilities, and commercial. Two, the commission recommends using a sales-based methodology to value all properties in the residential class. Three, the commission recommends assessing every property in the residential class at its full market value. Four, the commission recommends that annual market value changes in the new residential class be phased in over five years at the rate of 20% per year and that assessed value growth caps should be eliminated. Five, the commission recommends creating a partial homestead exemption for primary resident owners with income below a certain threshold. The exemption would be available to all eligible primary resident owners in the residential class and would replace the current condo, condo, the co-op condo tax abatement. Six, the commission recommends creating a circuit breaker within the property tax system to lower the property tax burden on low income primary resident owners based on the ratio of property taxes paid to income. Seven, the commission recommends replacing the current class share system with a system that prioritizes predictable and transparent tax rates for property owners. The new system would freeze the relationship of tax rates among the tax classes for five year periods after which time the city would conduct a mandated study to analyze if adjustments need to be made to maintain consistency in the share of taxes relative to fair market value borne by each tax class. Eight, the commission recommends that current valuation methods should be maintained for properties not in the new residential class, which includes rental buildings with more than 10 units, utilities, and commercial. Nine, the commission recommends a gradual transition to the new system for current owners with an immediate transition into the new system whenever a property in the new residential class is sold. Finally, 10, the rec 
the commission recommends instituting comprehensive reviews of the property tax system every 10 years. Um, before we begin, I would like to now introduce the public to the other members of the commission. Um, we will go in alphabetical order as last time, even though it still lets Alan Capelli from Staten Island speak first. Alan? Oh, uh, I'm Alan Capelli. I'm a homeowner. Uh, um, and also I have a co-op. So I'm kind of familiar with both uh, the implications of the uh, city's tax on both classes of property. Uh, I've been employed in public service for oh, almost 40 years. I'm, I've worked in the Bronx, I've worked in Queens, I've worked in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Staten Island. And I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about these proposals. Thank you. Next up, we have Carol O'Clarican. Hi, thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Carol O'Clarican. I'm former New York City Finance Commissioner and Budget Director. I'm currently teaching at, up at Columbia University. Uh, I want to assure all of you, since there's a large number of people testifying, you won't have very much time. I wanted to assure you that whatever you have submitted in writing will be read. I read all of the submissions so far this afternoon. So I want you to rest assured that whatever time you think you have tonight will not be wasted. Thank you. And next up we have Kenneth Knuckles. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kenneth Knuckles. I am vice chair of the New York City Planning Commission. Uh, my background is in public service. Uh, I have served as a commissioner of a large city agency. I have uh, served as a, a deputy borough president of Bronx County. Uh, I am still a resident of Bronx County. Uh, I reside in a two family home that I have owned since 1984. And I am uh, looking forward uh, to hearing from you this evening. And I thank you for your participation. Thank you. Um, so next up we have uh, James Parrott. Good evening. James Parrott, Director of Economic and Fiscal Policies at the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. Um, I'm a longtime uh, observer of the New York City economy and the city and state budget in tax situations. I'm very concerned about the um, inequities uh, in the city's property tax system. I believe we have um, uh, the right moment to try and address those inequities. We have worked very hard for the past two, two and a half years in putting together what we think is a, um, a very appropriate set of recommendations. We look forward to getting your feedback on those this evening. Uh, we look forward to engaging uh, our elected officials in Albany. And it's good to see that we have some with us uh, this evening. We will need to educate Albany on why it's important for New York City to um, drive its own path to property tax reform and not let it be dictated by uh, foreign wide interest elsewhere in the state. Um, I look forward to the testimony this evening. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, our, our final commissioner, Elizabeth Velez, is um, in transit from an airport and she will hopefully be joining us dur during the course of the evening tonight. Um, in addition to that, we have with us the ex officio members of the commission representing both the mayor's office and the city council. Um, I would like to now turn things over to Emery, our moderator for this evening's testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Shaw. My name is Emre Adev. I work at the New York City Council's Finance Division, and I will be helping to moderate tonight's hearing. Before we begin, I want to advise everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. Please note that if, you're mute, if you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Also, please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. I will be calling on panelists to testify one by one, so please listen for your name to be called. Commission members, you have the ability to unmute yourself during the hearing, so if you have a question for a panelist, 
You may unmute yourself at the appropriate time, but please remember to go back on mute once you have completed your question. We will now start with testimony from elected officials, followed by the general public. Panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. You will then have two minutes to present your testimony. The Sergeant will let you know when your time has expired. Uh, the first uh, panelist will be Senator, State Senator Andrew Gennardis, followed by Assemblymember Michael uh, Tenusis. Starting time. All right, can I begin? Yes, you may begin. Great, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm State Senator Andrew Gennardis uh, from uh, the 22nd District in Southern Brooklyn. Uh, I wanna thank Chairman Shaw and all the members of the Property Tax Reform Commission for the opportunity to testify this evening. Uh, I'll start out by saying that any reforms to our convoluted and outdated property tax system must first and foremost address the issue of equity between neighborhoods. Uh, Middle-class residents of my district pay an effective tax rate more than double that of gentrifying neighborhoods across the city, in large part due to the artificial 6% assessment cap, which winds up benefiting really wealthy homeowners at the expense of those struggling to make ends meet. I'm talking about middle-class families, civil servants here in our city. Uh, and while I applaud the commission's recommendation to eliminate these caps, uh, I worry that a wholesale repeal would lead to huge across the board spikes in tax bills, which is why uh, I independently proposed legislation to repeal the caps only for high income homeowners with high value property that I hope the commission will consider as part of their final recommendations. Along the same vein, any reforms to the property tax system must protect those whose home values have appreciated rapidly over the last few decades, despite no significant change in their income. These property owners who are property rich, but cash poor, will be negatively impacted by the proposal to do away with fractional assessments. Since class one homes are currently assessed at only 6% of their market value, this reform would devastate property owners without sufficient supports, such as a circuit breaker tax credit, another one of the commission's ideas. We don't need to reinvent the wheel when deciding what this should look like. New York City had a, a modest circuit breaker uh, as part of the property tax system from 2014 until recently, uh, which aimed to limit or link tax burdens with ability to pay, that tax credit should be looked to be expanded uh, as part of the commission's recommendations. Furthermore, we have to move away from the fixation on tax rates if we're gonna have a true discussion about lessening the property tax burden. Every year, our city government says that there has been no property tax rate increase. Time expired. But as we know, the tax levy has increased by triple over the last 20 years. Uh, we need to really address that conversation. And I think it's important that the commission proposes a solution towards a truth in budgeting requirement so that homeowners and property owners have a real sense as to uh, exactly how much their effective tax rate is increasing year over year and what the property tax levy is. I have a few more uh, things to say, but I, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. I will also submit my written testimony to the full commission. And I thank you again for uh, allowing me to, to uh, speak with you this evening. Uh, thank you, State Senator. Um, we will now hear from Assemblymember Michael Tanousis, followed by Councilmember Justin Brannan. Starting time. Thank you so much, members of the commission, for having me here today. Uh, as uh, many of you know, I testified about two weeks ago uh, at the Staten Island hearing, and the same goes uh, for my constituents in Brooklyn. Uh, obviously, you know the inequities that are occurring uh, in certain areas, especially, specifically my district in Staten Island and in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, compared to other parts of the city. Uh, so I'm happy uh, that finally, uh, the hearings are going forward so we can have that much needed uh, reform. Uh, back in February, uh, as uh, when Mayor de Blasio testified before the Joint Assembly and Senate, uh, I actually asked uh, Mayor de Blasio the specific question in regards to the commission, and I believe so did uh, Senator Andrew Gennardis. Uh, and I'm happy that finally we're going forward on this hearing. We do need property tax reform in the state. As so many of our residents continue to flee to other states for better opportunities for a lower cost of living. Uh, we need this now more than ever. So with that being said, uh, I'm confident, I'm hopeful 
uh, that you will bring much needed property tax reform. Uh, and Chairman Shaw, it is very nice to see you outside the CUNY Fellowship virtual classroom. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Assembly Member. Uh, we will now hear from Council Member Justin Brandon, followed by Council Member Dharma Diaz. Starting time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Shaw and uh, all the other commissioners here. After being delayed by delays and then shelved for a year due to the pandemic, the good news is the commission is back. The bad news is that our current mayor will no longer be in office to live up to his commitment by the time the commission uh, publishes its final report. We've now missed an entire year of making progress on reforming this badly busted property tax system. And now the dire need for this commission and the urgency for it to complete its work has never been more clear. Maybe it's not the case in Manhattan, but out here in the exotic outer boroughs, homeowners are not the super rich. They are seniors on fixed incomes, retired city workers and working families that are the second or third generation of their family to live in their childhood home and may need relief just like everyone else. We've heard time and time again how the mayor's own properties in Tony Park Slope are taxed at a far lower rate than most of the homes owned by middle-class New Yorkers in the outer reaches of the, of the five boroughs. Enough talk, the unfairness is indisputable. It's blindingly stark and it's gotta be changed once and for all. Property tax relief, not in the form of gimmicks or givebacks, but a true reform of the system is one way that we can fight to keep our city truly affordable. New Yorkers are squeezed. Google any metric from income taxes to your electric bill, and you'll find New York at near or at the top of the list. No one is immune to the climbing costs of housing and healthcare, transportation, and other necessities. We waited nearly two years for this commission to release a report, a report that told us what we already knew. Our property tax system is broken and unfair because it benefits the wealthiest 1% and crushes the rest of us. The long awaited report included 10 no brainer recommendations to address the savage inequities in the system with the goal of creating simpler, clearer and fairer property taxes. That's fine, but it's not enough to simply aim for a clearer and fairer system. I believe we also must offer real- Time expired. We must also offer real tangible relief in the form of a discount to those who have been paying unfairly for far too long. Um, I will submit the rest of my testimony uh, in writing, but I do believe that, that folks out in the outer boroughs um, need relief. It's not enough to just have some neighborhoods start paying their fair share. For the folks who have been paying too much for the past 30 years, they need a relief in the form of a discount. Thank you. Thank you, council member. We will now hear from council member Dharma Diaz followed by council member Brad Lander. Starting time. Good evening, Dharma Diaz, the 37th Councilmatic District. And I also have an honor of sitting the finance committee for New York City, a homeowner who has, prior to coming onto the council, has advocated for the unjust system and process that we have here in East New York. It's insane for me to believe that because developers have come into our communities, they flipped homes, we're taxed at a higher bracket than individuals who purchase and live in Park Slope. I, I wanna thank Justin, who also very politely said the same thing. I'll be sure and I'll be brief. Bottom line is enough is enough. We have to share the burden. Dharma Diaz, the 37 Council Matic District. I will also be sending in a formal testimony. We have not received it as of yet. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, we will now hear from council member Brad Lander followed by council member Alan Mazel. Starting time. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. Uh, we cannot continue with a system that on average under taxes homeowners like me in Park Slope where I live and own a home and over taxes homeowners in Bay Ridge or Staten Island or Eastern Queens. We must have the courage to move toward a more equitable system that taxes property fairly based on that on their real value, even if that means higher property tax bills over time for me and many of my neighbors. And I'm here tonight to tell you that we see it. It's not easy in a system that feels very zero sum, uh, but we have to have courage together. At the same time, it is critical to be very thoughtful about how we get from here to there. 
as your preliminary report rightly says, any property tax system should be fair, predictable, and transparent, and should not induce displacement among long-term homeowners and renters from the neighborhoods they've called home. Even in wealthier neighborhoods like Park Slope, there are, of course, many seniors and families on fixed incomes, people who bought their homes decades ago, uh, and the values have gone up significantly, but their incomes have not. Um, as the Commission's preliminary report rightly identifies, there are a number of ways to prevent those people from losing their homes. Uh, as you know, there could be a circuit breaker or exemption, which, which, which would protect low-income families, although there will always be people just above the line who will struggle greatly. So I'd urge you to consider more broadly the possibility that in some cases, taxes could be reset on sale of the property. Uh, that makes sense since you're proposing a sales-based methodology for valuation, or at least the taxes could be in some cases deferred until sale. Um, for some families, at least for low and moderate income ones. Let's remember this won't only be a, a one-time issue, right? Today, this feels like an inequity, and it is an inequity between, say, Park Slope and Bay Ridge, but in the years to come, new neighborhoods will see rapid increases in property values, and seniors and fixed income families in those neighborhoods will also need protections. Um, I'd also like to see more clearly how changes will benefit tenants and not simply owners of rental properties. That's a big part of why we're doing this change. We need to make sure that it comes to tenants themselves and not just to rental property owners. To conclude, I just want to say these are hard issues and they can feel very zero sum. Our challenge is to bring equity to an inequitable system and to set us up collectively on a stronger course for our city's long-term future. Thank you for this opportunity. We must indeed move forward. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, we will now hear from Council Member Alan Maisel, followed by Council Member Common Yeager. Starting time. Council Member, you're. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about this extremely important issue. Uh, for as long as I've been involved in the government service, uh, going back. 16 years as elected service and before that in other capacities, the issue of property tax unbalance uh, has been uh, a very, very significant problem for my constituents. Uh, everybody knows about the uh, Park Slope uh, problem, uh, but it's not just Park Slope. As uh, Councilman Lander pointed out, there are other neighborhoods that in the future may start becoming gentrified and property values will go up. Inequities will no doubt continue. So we have to find some reasonable ways to make things fair. Um, now more than ever, uh, this is extraordinarily important for the future of our city. I'm not, not going to repeat what everybody else has said, except to say I'm looking forward to seeing a productive hearing and a report that will come out uh, sooner than later to address these extraordinarily important issues. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we will now hear from Councilmember Kalman Yeager, followed by Councilmember Fire Lewis. Starting time. Uh, apparently, Councilmember Yeager is not on just now, um, so we will go to Councilmember Fire Lewis. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Matthew Pitt representing, I'm sorry, Deputy Chief of Staff Matthew Pitt representing uh, Councilmember Farrah Lewis. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to allow me to testify on the recommendations proposed by the Commission. And just to let you guys know, I am reading this statement on her behalf. For the past two years, I've, for the past two years, I have represented and served Council District 45 in Brooklyn, which is home to low income New Yorkers who have worked hard to build generational wealth and promote stability through home ownership. In the past year, we have seen record levels of economic and housing insecurity that disproportionately impact the black and brown communities. As we move towards recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important for us to engage in public discourse on what the city can do to help New Yorkers age in place. After reviewing the commission's report, I wanna commend the members for working dil diligently to create a more equitable tax system to ensure fairness while expanding transparency for homeowners. Our collective goal is to support homeowners and preserving the affordability of housing so that New York City remains inclusive and diverse for all. 
the periodic review of our property tax system every decade, which would likely coincide with the census, would be instrumental in keeping pace with the socioeconomic changes in communities across the five boroughs. Thank you. And thank you for allowing me to deliver the statement. Thank you. Um, we will now go with uh, go to uh, members of the public, um, starting with Faye Palin, followed by Rachel Hakim. Starting time. Hello, my name is Faye Palin. I am the president of my condominium, which is in Oceana, uh, in Brighton Beach. And I am speaking for 15 condominium buildings in this complex. We wanna thank the New York City Advisory Commission on Property Tax Reform for addressing this very complicated issue. However, it's not clear to us that we're included in this. Nowhere does it mention condos. I'll give you an example. If you look at the New York Times on May 9th, the real estate, you see a house sold for 595 uh, sorry, $1,595,000 with taxes of 1,308. I personally pay $11,000 in real estate taxes. We are not the wealthy here. We are the middle class. I am a retired civil service worker. I'm not clear with number one, we don't fit into that, into the new residential class. And we're not mentioned at all in number eight. Rentals are mentioned. So it's not clear that our issues are being addressed at all. That's a big concern for us and I hope you reconsider it. Thank you so much for giving me this time to speak. Thank you for the testimony. Um, we will now hear from Rachel Hakim followed by Leticia Romaro. Starting time. Hello, um, thank you for uh, calling on me. I, I'm a homeowner, I am a musician. And I perform Gabriel, my husband performed art and we both played with the artist Wayne Shorter who's a very prominent jazz musician. We own two multifamilies in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I'm now 58, my husband is 62. And this law will end our careers um, as landlords. Um, there's no question. In a four family can't be classified with anything other than a one through three. And we're having this problem with local law 152 as well, where we're being subject to some kind of different category of income. I'm not sure what you think we're making, but we're not making much. And this year we, we gave discounts to um, our artist tenants, our video artists, our store. We, they've been paying half rent all year. And I'm just not sure about this proposal at all because if you start, you know, Williamsburg is a rapidly rising values oriented neighborhood. They trade properties like they're, you know, trading dolls. And um, the developers have forced the, the uh, values up, but that doesn't reflect in rents and it doesn't reflect in my cash. In fact, I had to borrow $99,000 from New York Forward to make up for the $96,000 I lost in rent. Not to mention we make 0. 0.0007 cents per stream when you listen to your favorite song. And um, so we're get, I'm getting squeezed as a landlord in every single way. And it's from, and we need the help of the city council. Um, you're pushing us into pro poverty. I don't like anything that's being proposed here in terms of raising our taxes one single penny. Yeah, I have fancy looking values on paper, but I can't raise the rents because my, my tenants don't make the money to pay. Yeah, we just have to ask you guys to please reconsider the owner, you know, the artist, musician owners and the older owners, because you're going to steal our wealth for our children. If you put, we don't want a tax credit, we don't want a circuit breaker, we don't want our taxes to go up one penny, and we don't want you to change the method, methodology to, um, you know, to that so-called so value. It doesn't put money in our pocket and it steals our children's future. Thanks for letting me talk. 
and love that you're working so hard on this. Thank you pass. That. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we will now hear from, and I, I apologize if I'm uh, mispronouncing anyone's names, uh, but Letitia Romaro, followed by Marianne Rothman. Starting time. Hi, I'm Letitia Romaro, and I'm running for Staten Island Borough President. And I wanna thank you for undertaking this gargantuan task. Um, listen, governing by mystery is never a good idea. And homeowners need a degree from M MIT to understand our tax system right now. I think that your biggest problem comes on page three in your summary. Your task, your goal is to make the system simpler, fairer, and clearer without reducing income to the city. So what does that mean? It means that you are shifting the burden from homeowners to um, uh, small business owners and for to people who have uh, multifamily residences that they own that haven't collected taxes in a year. That's a problem. Listen, we in a post COVID world, we have learned to work remotely. When I go door to door, the number one complaint on people's minds in Staten Island is property taxes. And the number one statement that I hear from young homeowners in their 40s is, I can't wait to get out of this city. That is not what we want to hear. You have an opportunity here to really fix a system that was broken when you got it. So I, I understand that. But we have to really think about it. The people of New York City, the property owners have been asked to do more with less this last year. We need to have you continue to work on this because your solutions, while they look good, as I said before, they just shift the burden. We need you to really restructure our property taxes. We need to make sure that people are not only be being treated equitable, but that you do something to keep them here. Because if the middle class leaves New York City, and it will, because in a post-COVID world, as I said before, when you can work remotely from anywhere, we might not be the greatest place on earth anymore. That red velvet rope um, of, you know, gotcha government and only the good, uh, only the strongest survive I'm in expired. New York City may not continue on. So please continue to look at this, work with the city council, work with the state legislature, fix this and give us a 2% tax cap um, as we have around the state of New York. Thank you again. My name is Leticia Romaro. Thank you for that testimony. We will now hear from Marianne Rothman followed by Jacqueline Griffin. Starting time. Good evening. My name is Marianne Rothman, and I'm the executive director of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums, uh, which represents hundreds of the housing cooperatives and condominiums in all five boroughs of New York City and beyond. Since 1990, when we founded the Action Committee for Reasonable Real Estate Taxes, we have advocated for fair, equitable, and easily understood property taxes for all New York City. Today, I would like to comment on pro proposal number six regarding circuit breakers. The commission's first four recommendations create a uniform, clearly understandable system of assessments for all properties in the proposed residential class. A homestead exemption should then mitigate the tax burden, burden on every New Yorker for whom their house, condominium, or cooperative is their primary residence. Circuit breakers move in now. They, they provide a means of leveling the playing field for long-term New Yorkers who are real estate rich, but subsisting on meager savings, or for individuals with special needs or those providing special services. The commission has suggested circuit breakers for low-income resident owners and notes that it intends to look more closely at circuit breakers for, for, for before issuing its final recommendations. We would suggest adding a circuit breaker for individuals on fixed incomes whose income may exceed low income definitions, but who still need help to be able to remain in their homes. Additionally, the city should of course maintain current consideration for people with disabilities, for veterans, adding veterans of Cold War, as was suggested in the at the Staten Island hearing, and for seniors with incomes below a certain threshold. 
We could also consider adding circuit breakers to help low and moderate income families with small children and to otherwise promote social justice. Thank you for this opportunity to express our views. Thank you for that testimony. We will now hear from Jacqueline Griffin, followed by Teresa Scavo. Starting time. Good evening. My name is Jacqueline Griffin. I'm an attorney in the Foreclosure Prevention Project at Brooklyn Legal Services, which is a borough office of Legal Services NYC. I'm a longtime Brooklyn resident and I represent other longtime residents and homeowners in this borough. One of the most glaring omissions of the report is that it does not discuss the potential racial impact of the reforms being recommended. New York City's property tax system does not exist in a vacuum. It is layered on top of a highly segregated housing landscape that has been shaped by structural racism in the form of redlining, reverse redlining, discriminatory sales practices, and other forms of housing discrimination against black and brown residents. New York City has acknowledged this history in the recent report on fair housing called Where We Live. Among the stated goals of the report is to preserve affordable housing and prevent displacement of longstanding residents and to make equitable investments to address the neighborhood-based legacy of discrimination, segregation, and concentrated poverty. It is well known that black and brown homeowners are paying more in property taxes than white homeowners in similar contexts. Additionally, homeowners in majority minority neighborhoods are more likely to be on the lien sale list. All of these forces contribute to gentrification of historically black and brown neighborhoods that drives up home prices. And one of the reasons that they have been able to maintain homeownership is because of the 6% cap on assessed value. The commission proposes to replace this cap with a means tested program to prevent displacement of longtime homeowners. The problem with this recommendation is that the Department of Finance has a long history of failures in implementing means tested programs. So much of my work and my colleagues work is with homeowners who are unaware of the exemptions and abatements available to them or who are wrongfully denied access to these programs. The most glaring example of this failure is the property tax and interest deferral program, which was designed to permit homeowners below a certain income level to pay taxes as a percentage of their income. It was passed almost two and a half years ago. And as of December, expired. had only 187 homeowners enrolled. Any reform that ignores the impact on neighborhoods of color and homeowners of color will only serve to exacerbate existing racial inequities. I'd like to refer the commission to my written testimony for further details. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Teresa Scavo, followed by Laura Bernbeck. Starting talk. I have no statement, I'm sorry. Okay, all right, thank you very much then. Um, we will then hear from Laura Bernbeck, followed by Ralph Yozo. Starting time. Hello, members of the Property Tax Reform Commission and the public. My name is Laura Bernbeck. I am the executive director of the Brooklyn Heights Association. Thank you for hearing our testimony this evening. Property tax reform is an important and positive step towards resolving the imbalance of tax burden on residential properties. We hope that this reform will also address the thousands of mixed use buildings in our neighborhood commercial corridors where landlords accommodate residential, some rent regulated, commercial and retail uses together. Given the impact taxes have on the ability of landlords to support our small businesses, mixed use taxation must be viewed just as urgently as residential only policy. Designed correctly, property taxes can both replenish city coffers and ensure that our small businesses and landlords are able to help each other survive and thrive. Our organization and membership strongly recommends that this body consider property tax changes that can spur the creation and sustainability of small businesses while ensuring that storefronts don't sit empty, blighting our local streets. One local landlord put it succinctly, do the math. I have almost 150K in real estate taxes and eight small residential units, more than half are rent regulated. The only way to make up the difference is with the ground floor commercial rent. As the city recovers, we cannot simply return to the old days of ever rising rents, ever more burdened small business owners and ever present national chains. We must build stronger foundations to protect our small business and landlord communities 
and by extension, our neighborhoods and quality of life. Our organization is advocating for three things. Number one, implement a property tax exemption for landlords who rent to small business owners. This simple action will favor local entrepreneurs as they compete for tenancy against deep pocketed national chains. Number two, apply the same exemption for vacant properties if the landlord creates and properly maintains the space for a community use. This could run the gamut from bike parking space to a local artist showcase. And number three, tax or levy other fees on landlords who leave vacant spaces unkempt, unclean or boarded up. We understand that the discussion tonight is focused on residents, but we hope that this commission will also examine how it can create a bright and sustainable future for New York's world renowned small businesses and owners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we will now hear from Ralph Yozo, followed by Sandy Renz. Starting time. Hello, thank you very much. I want to thank everyone. I want to say to our friends in Williamsburg, the request is 2% or the rate of inflation should be the cap. Of course, once we reset everything to a correct value, we can't have unlimited growth. Like it's just completely unfair. But my main question is this, and I hope someone can answer yes or no. Is there a real example in all the many pages of, of advisory commission reports that shows the phase in with a real example, with real numbers, assess value at this, just like the Department of Finance? I have to thank uh, uh, Commissioner Solomon. Uh, for being, they have some documents that have real examples. So how in the world can you give a phase in and not give real examples? Because nobody understands what you mean by phase in over five years. No one understands that uh, that I know of. So can someone answer yes or no? Is there an example somewhere in all the documents? Can anyone? No? Nothing, yeah. So uh, it would be helpful if there was real examples in the document, just like the Department of Finance has the uh, class one and class two documents that show very simple examples. The other one is we also have to consider the crazy way cost affidavits are, are implemented in the Department of Finance. You, you literally can do a half a million dollar renovation and put the uh, $300,000 on the demolition line. Right. And then you get no effect of your property tax. It doesn't change too much. Right. Who is reviewing the cost affidavits? Because if you put an honest one in, you get a 200 percent tax increase. If you put a dishonest one in, nobody even checks it and you get uh, no tax increase. So this is time expired. Crazy. So I would appreciate some input in your report about cost affidavits. Thank you. Mr. Yozo. Yes. Oh, thank you. I, I would just like to say that I agree with you about examples, and uh, I will uh, bring that up. So thank you for that your, your comments. Um, Commissioner Ray, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that testimony. We will now hear from Sandy Renz, followed by Councilmember uh, Common Yeager. Starting time. Hi, you can hear. Um, I appreciate this complicated issue, and I know that it's really hard to figure out a way to do this, but I am one of the homeowners that my finances do not reflect the real estate bubble that I live in. I don't live in Park Slope, but my the real estate values around me are astronomical. I am not selling my home. I live in my home, but and my property taxes have gone up and up. So I find that the way that the houses are assessed and that if you go by market value, it is not realistic for my, for me. And also I have some rentals and I, there is a housing crisis and I wanna keep my rentals affordable and having all of these charges, so many charges going up and up and up makes it very difficult to get by with keeping the apartments affordable and also for myself. If indeed this is gonna stay the way that the houses are assessed and the taxes are, 
hopefully it will be a easy way to apply for exemptions based on your income, as well as knowing about what these exemptions and circuit breakers or whatever they are would be so that you can have an equitable way to pay your property taxes when you are still living in a home that and you are not getting millions of dollars for that home. And I think what everyone else has been saying is very valuable as well. That's it, thank you. Thank you for that testimony. We'll now hear from Councilmember Kalman Yeager, uh, followed by uh, Marvin Ciparin. Time starts now. Maybe having some troubles with the council member right now, so we will come back to him uh, when we get that sorted out and move on to Marvin Ciparin, followed by Esther Blount. Time starts now. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. So my name is Marvin. I'm not appearing on the screen. My name is Marvin Ciparin, and I'm a 77 year old retired owner of a small two family home and also a progressive and lifelong New Yorker. And I'm deeply concerned about the impact of extreme economic inequality on poor New Yorkers' lives and on our city and its nation as a whole. But I strongly oppose recommendation three because taxing homes at their full market value will not address economic inequality or racial inequality and is likely to have unintended consequences. Low and middle income homeowners and retirees living on fixed incomes, such as an 84 year old person that was cited in the New York Times article on this issue, would face significantly higher taxes just because the values of their homes have increased. And it's not just uh, wealthier neighborhoods that would be affected. For example, Street Easy reports that between 2012 and 2017, the average price for homes increased by 140% in Hamilton Heights, 125% in Bed-Stuy, and 87% in the Concourse in the Bronx. Brooklyner on February 1st, 2020 reported that in the past decades, the prices of homes in Williamsburg, Green Point, and Potts of Bushwick increased by an average of almost $250,000. Because the real estate values have increased much more than incomes for all but the richest New Yorkers, higher property taxes will make it harder for many homeowners to remain in their houses. Increased property taxes coupled with the loss of federal income tax deductions for local taxes will put added pressure on small landlords to raise rents. And since New York City has a higher income in computer, commuter taxes- Time expired. Values, will further fuel great exodus to the suburbs. A much better approach would include increases on the assessed value of homes when they are resold and significantly higher taxes on ultra luxury homes that are not the owner's primary residences, not on long time residents who have no more money just because the value of our houses have increased. Many of the people living in homes that are whose values have increased much higher, like myself and my neighbors, are retired civil servants, people who have worked for nonprofit organizations, teachers. If you can conclude your remarks, Marvin, appreciate it. I'm concluding by saying, think about the unintended consequences and thank you for your work and for listening to my testimony. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we'll now hear from Esther Blount, followed by A. Gravery. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Esther Blount. I, I live in Fort Greene um, in a house that I inherited from my aunt. My uncle bought this house in 1936. It always has remained in the family. I worry 
I'm a civil servant. I'm on community board two, the land use committee. I see developers coming in these neighborhoods trying to take over everything. I'm afraid that when people can't afford the taxes on their houses, they'll probably knock it down and build a big building. I'm very concerned about the circuit breakers and how that would work. I heard that um, it's going to be based on your income plus your income and your assets. I would like to know what that means. Does that mean my retirement assets? Does it? I don't know what that means. And when I die, if I leave the house to my kids, how would the circuit breaker work with them? Would it go by their income or some other formula that we don't know exists? So there's so many unanswered questions that it's hard to really <laughs> know what's going on. So I think um, this should be done a little better. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will now hear from A. Gravery, followed by Robert Camacho. Time starts now. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Um, hello. My name, uh, excuse me, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that I have lived in bed all of my life. I have been, I have seen firsthand the changes in my community, the gentrification, the real estate investors pushing my friends and family out, the local stores closing down because of increased commercial rents. As a lifelong resident, part of a multiple generation of Brooklynites, it was completely frustrating to read this 72 page proposal that essentially increases property taxes for residential houses. The influx of new residents has inevitably caused shifts in demographics. This proposed policy change should reflect the nuances of that shift and not treat residents who have been here for decades with the same broad strokes. It appears that there is a lack of understanding in the communities you're representing. I had never received a survey asking me if I lived in my brownstone, nor, have, nor how I would manage with an increase in my property taxes that is unsustainable. There seems to be an assumption that residents that have occupied Brooklyn for generations no longer live here due to gentrification, or that the property we own is for income generation and not a home that we have created for ourselves and family. No one interviewed my neighbors and I to see if actual longtime residents were still living in central Brooklyn, which they are. Let me say that emailing a 72 page document that you need a tax consultant to decipher feels intentional to make sure it falls through the cracks. There should be more supports in place with a rollout of this magnitude with newly proposed policy changes. A one page summary using common terms and examples would have been helpful. We are still in a pandemic, so making the information digestible and understandable should have been a priority. Specifically, here are my concerns. Right. A person living uh, in a co-op is not the same as a person uh, is not the same as a family, sometimes multi-generational living in a house. So why would they have the same tax code? The commission says that y'all are trying to simplify the tax code. But for whom? Applying a blanket 20 percent as you lump everyone together, that seems unfair. All right. <clears throat> and when you add that every 10 years, you're going to increase it. That's very troubling. Finally, have you thought about racial and economic equity while creating the tax code? It's 2021 and not creating this with Time that expired. lens. Smack okay, well, just not creating it with that lens is a smack in the face of every black and brown family that made Brooklyn what it is. What do you think the long-term effects will be for this property tax increase for black and brown residents? I love bed -Stuy. I'm thankful for the legacy my grandmother left me. However, even if you are left a home through inheritance, if you can't afford the taxes on it, it's a moot point because you'll put a tax lien on it and then you lose generational wealth. Um, I will be providing the rest of my testimony. I'll email it. Thank you so much for hearing me out. Please stay safe. Have a good uh, day. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Robert Camacho, followed by Marsha Hillis. Time starts now. I'm so tired about it. Hello? Hello? We can hear you. Okay, yes. okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Camacho. I have lived in Bushwick uh, all my life, uh, 60 years. Uh, my grandmother was 103 when uh, Bushwick was burning and nobody wanted, and there was no tax 
assessment there. And the city was giving the land away for a dollar. Everyone that's on this call remembers. And uh, it, they took a year to build and still now all of a sudden with gentrification, they're building 60, 70 units. And the people that have one family, there's not a family or oriented place anymore. My kids can't be raised in a place where they were born or purchase something where they were born because of taxes, the insurance, the water. And they were born and raised here when nobody wanted to be here. All right, when no one wanted to be here. Now gentrifiers and the, the cost of living, we really need to assess this for the people and the people that have been here that are really dying. Every time something happens, poor communities like mine and Bushwick suffer. AIDS, COVID, a, a, a dope. Every time fires, burns. What's going on with this? If you are a true advisory, advise for the poor people that are barely, barely making and starving and dying now. 103. I'm in my father's home for 40 years. I bought this from my father because he wanted me to stay with it. I bought it from him. He just charged me the bare minimum that he paid. He paid $35,000 for this house. And look how much it's worth now. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not selling my property. How is this even possible that we pay more taxes than anything? And there's no way we can't keep living like this. And I'm, I'm a retired from the city of New York, New York City Housing Authority. I'm on a broke income. And you keep killing us and pounding us and pounding us and pounding us. And all these people do is pay the $3,000 rent, $4,000 rent. That's the same thing we pay in taxes. We really need something needs to be done. And we really need to do something now. The poor people are suffering and we really need Time to- Time expired. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for that testimony. We will now hear from Marsha Hillis, followed by Jeff Golkin. Time starts now. I'm reading my testimony. Dear commissioners, I'm submitting my testimony in response to the new property tax recommendations. This new proposal could significantly and adversely affect my ability to keep my home, which I've worked so hard to afford since we pur purchased it in 1998. This issue not only impacts us, but many New Yorkers like us who have been able to hold on to their properties as their communities gentrify around them. I've lived in Brooklyn since 1989. I'm a teacher, single mom, and community volunteer. Over the years, I've volunteered service for Brooklyn community, including serving on Brooklyn Bridge Park Development, LDC, Community Board 2, Land Use Committee, founding president of our neighborhood association, landmarking, planting our first trees, getting our first garbage removal, and, and parking plan with DOT. In the 32 years that I've been a teacher here in a local school, I've taught over 4,000 New York City students. Yet, if the new tax plan moves forward as planned, I will lose my home. My neighbors and I, we are six residential and one factory formed an LLC in order to purchase our property, a small five-story building in Brooklyn, when our landlady told us she wanted to sell the building. We're all artists and first generation brush factory. It took all that we could to afford our places, but we managed. Over the years, we've been making necessary improvements that we can to raise the money to do such things as repointing our brick facade, replacing our roof, upgrading our elevator. It's a slow process, but we're getting there. We are truly the little engine that could. My concern with the new proposal is how our property will be valued under it. After we bought our humble property, the neighborhood has gentrified around us. Our particular neighborhood has mushroomed with luxury condos valued and sold at multiple millions of dollars. This reality does not reflect our reality by any means. Our scrappy Time expired. Um, we will lose our homes if we are valued according to our neighborhood. We we are not typical of our neighborhood. There needs to be provisions for long time, low income people who are in gentrified neighborhoods. We're talking about teachers. We're talking about older people, and 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 there. It, there's no, there's no plan for those people. 
Thank you for that testimony. Um, we will now hear from Jeff Golkin, followed by Jennifer uh, Gabori. Time starts now. Okay, sorry for that delay. My name is Jeff Galkin. I'm an attorney, been practicing for 40 years. My practice has been representing property owners. I thought I was a lone voice on May 11th when I spoke to the commission, but I'm now hearing from the real people who have basically corroborated the fact that although these recommendations and the work of the commission is well intended, the unforeseen consequences are enormous. These recommendations are gonna precipitate higher taxes, displacement, and disinvestment in New York City. You cannot have comprehensive tax reform if you don't deal with all of the tax classes. You've heard tonight from a lot of the people who are gonna be left behind. Frankly, you can't take away protections that people have had for 40 years and suddenly turn the system upside down by making it worse than it is. And frankly, these uh, homestead exemptions and uh, circuit breakers are very short on detail. And uh, there haven't been any examples as, as, as Mr. Yozo had indicated. But what disturbs me is the fact that there are so many people who are gonna be left behind. You're gonna hurt the very people that you want to help. So there has to be comprehensive reform, including all of the taxes, that includes uh, Miss Fallon's Oceana condominium complex, the mixed use properties in Brooklyn Heights, the mom and pop stores, the real people. I wanna close, because I only have a limited amount of time by saying, we should start at the beginning, where it happens, at the Department of Finance, that is charged with almost an impossible task to assess more than a million parcels a year. They simply don't have the time to do it properly. It results in many properties being underassessed many being overassessed and repeating the same problem year in and year out. So my recommendation is to not only reject these recommendations one to four and these circuit breakers and homestead exemptions short on detail, but go back to the very beginning. Time give expires. The give the Department of Finance sufficient time, resources, training, personnel, tools to do the job properly and don't do it every single year because you can't do it in a year. And that's why you repeat the work papers each year incorrectly. So I appreciate your consideration of these concerns that have been raised. I'm very proud of my fellow Brooklynites and also the suggestions about looking at the source of the Department of Finance for uh, reform. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will now hear from Jennifer Gabori, followed by Felicia Wharton. Time starts now. Can you hear me now? Okay, hi, I'm Jen Gabori. Thank you so much for the chance to offer uh, uh, testimony. I wanna thank you for your hard work. I live in Southern Brooklyn here in Bay Ridge uh, and I know how important this issue is of property tax fairness to my neighbors. But I'm here to speak uh, on behalf of the PSC CUNY. I teach at Hunter College and um, I'm here to, on behalf to speak up not only for the 30,000 members uh, and faculty and staff that we represent, um, but also on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of CUNY students and alumni um, who uh, are connected to CUNY. If you think about all of the people that have a connection to CUNY in New York City, it is uh, more than one in eight New Yorkers. A recent report by City Comptroller uh, Scott Stringer highlighted the importance of investment to CUNY to the economic health of the city. And given our significant unmet needs, we would like to strongly urge you to recommend the fashioning of a pilot, a payment in lieu of tax, Taxes that we would like to see New York University and Columbia University make. And this builds, of course, on the testimony you've heard previously from my colleagues at other hearings, as well as what you're going to hear um, from Dr. Felicia Wharton in just a moment. We don't believe that the people who designed the exemption for private universities ever would have foreseen the vast land holding and resources, including
including endowments that NYU and Columbia currently hold. As you know from past testimony in 2018, we estimated the property that property taxes on the land that Columbia and NYU hold would be would be more than 460 million, and we believe they should be paying paying a share of that um, in the form of a pilot. It's not that we don't believe that NYU and Columbia don't make a contribution, but that we believe they should be doing what, in fact, other elite universities do across the Ivy system. This wasn't something that I knew prior to looking at and learning about this issue, that, that Columbia, Harvard, Princeton University, Yale University all make pilots in order to pay for the public services that their institutions depend upon and that elite universities should be paying their private share and making that contribution. We believe that contribution should be earmarked then to help make a contribution to the City University of New York um, in the interest of equity and fairness in higher education um, in New York State. Time one, last thing, one thing I would tell you, I would just say as a parent, uh, I really appreciate that these hearings are on Zoom. And when post pandemic, I and while I would appreciate being back together with people, I also hope you will consider continuing to have forums like this online. Thanks so much. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Felicia Wharton, followed by Audrey Brown. Time starts now. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Felicia Wharton. I'm a member of the Professional Staff Congress, um, it's a union that represents uh, 30,000 faculty and staff of the City University of New York. I'm a doctoral lecturer at the Brooklyn Educational Opportunity Center, administered by New York City Technical College, which is located in downtown Brooklyn. I'm also a resident of Crown Heights. Now, tonight I want to bring to your attention the issue of property tax exemptions and want you to consider that if it's appropriate that private universities in New York City are exempted from almost nearly all property taxes. Now, the two private universities, NYU and Columbia, they have massively expanded their real estate footprint in recent decades, and they have prospered from their real estate investments. Now, when you look at the potential property tax responsibility of NYU, that's like somewhere around $188.5 million, and Columbia comes in like around $274 million, and this is according to the Department of Finance um, formula. Now, these figures are low. Um, in 2018, Barbara Bowen actually testified and presented these figures, but it presents an important starting point that this is a significant source of untapped revenue. Um, I don't think the State Commission for Property Tax Exemptions for private universities um, envisioned that NYU and Columbia would have accumulated like this vast and valuable estate holdings, real estate holdings, in addition to their multi-billion dollar um, endowments. Now, this is not an attack on NYU and Columbia. Um, we value our colleagues in academia. Um, they bring this intellectual community that have generated resources for New York City, but collecting a fair share of property taxes from these two heavily endowed private universities and redirect that to relieve the underfunding of CUNY would be appropriate and a significant time expired in reducing educational um, inequality. So in the spirit of equity, um, we propose that the commission reconsider the tax exemption of NYU and Columbia and collect an appropriate tax revenue, invest that revenue in CUNY, New York's public university, where the majority of New York City college students attend I attended a CUNY college, Hunter College, um, where my colleague works. And I also attended the Graduate Center. And my family members also attended a CUNY college as well. Um, thank you for um, allowing me to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Audrey Brown, followed by Richard de Cesare. Time starts now. Good evening, I'm Audrey Brown. I'm president of the 245 Henry Street Cooperative in Brooklyn Heights. Our co-op is comprised of 56 small units of studio and one bedroom uh, units. Our shareholders are primarily city workers, middle-class folks, artists, self-employed folks, and a lot of retirees on fixed incomes. Uh, a majority of our shareholders would, would not qualify at, I, we don't think, of the circuit breaker relief available to low-income residents. 
This issue is extremely important to us because uh, for the last six plus years, our co-op property taxes have increased 15% a year. Um, and why? It, it, because our property taxes were, were levied based on the rental market in our neighborhood, which had extraordinarily high rental values, um, which really didn't reflect the value of our building. Nonetheless, we had to pay those taxes. Your recommendation to cure this inequity doesn't really um, address our issues. In fact, it does just the opposite in our zip code, which is 11201, where single to three family brownstones sell in the millions of dollars to movie stars, uh, hedge funders, and international investors. So your proposed initial recommendation may work in other zip codes, but it clearly would only hurt the working and middle class uh, co-op residents in, in our zip code. The tax abatements we've been receiving over the years uh, don't begin to make up for the huge financial hardship that the city's 15% uh, annual property tax increases have imposed on our shareholders. In fact, for some reason, some mysterious reason, our 2020 tax abatement was reduced by 12,000 and we were never told why. So due to the ever increasing tax burdens, uh, we've not been able to improve our building in the way we want. We've had to cut staff, we've had to put off needed improvements and raise maintenance almost every year. Time expired. Uh, just let me say a more equi equitable way and sensible way for assessing property taxes on co-ops, which are not real property, would be to base those taxes on the sales of comparable co-ops, not single family homes, in, in our particular area. I hope you take that under consideration. I'll submit my, my testimony in writing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, we will now hear from Richard de Cesare, followed by Sante Michelli. Time yeah. starts now. I'm sorry, Ms. Brown. Uh, I just want to Sam Ray Majeski, and uh, I'm a co-op owner in uh, Brooklyn Heights, also on the corner from you. Um, and the idea would be to compare the value of co-ops with similar co-ops rather than with single family homes. So uh, we are trying in our recommendations to address that issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Richard is there, followed by Sante Michelli. Time starts now. Good evening, my name is Richard D. Caesar. I'm the treasurer of a residential co-op in Cobble Hill. Uh, as with the, the last speaker, we have a similar problem with regard to um, taxes per square foot, where our neighbors across the street live in palatial brownstones, and we have 700 square foot apartments, and we pay more per square foot than our neighbors across the street. I have uh, two questions regarding recommendation one of the commission. Uh, the first is whether this new residential category includes all uh, cooperative residences and condominiums uh, and not just those having uh, 10 or fewer units. I'm assuming it's all, but if I'm mistaken, please let me know. Uh, the second question is, uh, what do we do about the luxury condominium, luxury rental uh, hybrid? Uh, the Condominiums have become a large source of the citywide rental inventory. And at the higher end, they do not behave like simple owner-occupied residences, but more like income-generating investments. The luxury rental condo concept has driven new construction to a substantial degree, funded in part by the 421A abatements, where we have abatements and credits passed on to owners of condominium units, many of whom rent out their units for profit. The other question is in regard to recommendation number five, the partial homestead exemption. What are we going to do about the STAR, senior citizen and veterans credits? Uh, will we be running systems in parallel to determine whether everyone is a little better off without being worse off? Uh, I thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to the commission. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 
we will now hear from Sante Michelli, followed by Jane Clark. Starting time. Uh, good evening, uh, Commissioner and participants. Um, I'm Sante Micheli. Uh, I'm an immigrant. I'm a naturalized American. I'm a member of Community Board One. I'm the chair of the Rich Community, uh, the Rich Committee SCB One. I'm a community activist, and I'm also a home owner together with uh, my wife. Uh, she's a teacher and uh, with a friend. So this three family building in Greenpoint, which has been an area devastated already by uh, development, the entire waterfront, the developer been getting 30 years tax abatement. Uh, my neighbors next door, they own the house for three, four generations, literally both the house next to mine for 100 years. Uh, they don't even have uh, uh, probably a very large pension, you know, and thanks to these houses being passed generation after generation. My case and the one of my wife, as an artist and designer as myself, I literally don't have a retirement. You know, uh, the retirement is this home. Even the possibility of uh, uh, making some gain with increase of market value and selling the house at a certain point will, when that will be impossible to be in New York is the only things I personally, I got. Uh, An increase in taxes more than what it is today, it will be devastating to us. Extremely devastating. You know, I, 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 it's kind of unacceptable. And the same it will be for many of our neighbors here in Greenpoint. This is an historic district. We are getting the burden of uh, uh, having a house, which is a, it's another responsibility, you know, and added the cost. And, uh, and I'm very handy myself as an artist. So I've been doing a lot of work myself, things that you can even deduct the time that's been spent into this home. And, uh, and, and any increase in taxes, it definitely it will not allow us to be here. And, uh, and even uh, the moment we'll have to sell the house, uh, for sure, we'll have to sell it below the market value because some developer will make some plan to buy this house. So it will be always a loss. Time and expired. This, the middle class that is the backbone of all our neighbors, really. And, and, and I, I arrived here with $200, you know, and uh, very shortly I realized that I had to be creative and I had to be an entrepreneur. And, but this will be very, very damaging and you have not done outreach. And I'm a member of the, I'm the chair of the outreach committee. I invite you before anything is put in place that proper, proper outreach is done uh, and not during the pandemic, uh, certainly. Thank you very much. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Jane Clark, followed by Priscilla Basnavi. Starting time. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I, I feel that I've been very moved by some of uh, the speakers tonight. It's obvious to me that um, you've inherited a, a, a really complicated problem to try and solve. And I'm grateful for the time and effort that seems to have been put in to try and unravel this. At the same time, uh, I want to echo what my husband has said. Uh, I, I'm a teacher. I'm also an immigrant. Uh, I am reaching retirement age myself. Uh, and to suddenly find that some of the hopes and plans that we'd had to enjoy um, the latter part of our lives in this wonderful um, part of New York City in Brooklyn uh, is, is really quite a shock for us. Um, we may not be in, in a, as bad a situation as many of the people who have spoken, and uh, but at the same time, it does seem that... Uh, there are no simple solutions to this, but we urge those of you who are continuing to work on this, that you, you continue to keep people in mind who have worked all of their lives um, in, in ways that have hopefully uh, improved the state of the city. We moved to Brooklyn out of chance. Um, we, we looked to buy a house for, for a long, long time, and eventually we bought somewhere we could afford in a neighborhood that we feel very fortunate to have been able to move into. Uh, we didn't ask for the developers to move in. We didn't anticipate that uh, the changes that happened in our neighborhood would happen and happen so quickly. Uh, what we chose to do was put what little money we had into having a comfortable home with a garden. 
uh, and we would like to be able to stay here and enjoy um, the senior part of our lives in this same neighborhood. And some of the time expired um, that are that are uh, being considered now will make that impossible for us. So um, we look forward to hearing more about how this can be unraveled to everybody's advantage and make it a more equi equitable um, situation. Thank you for your time and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Priscilla Ghaznavi, followed by Omar Walker. Starting time. Hi, my name is Priscilla Ghaznavi. I live in the south side of Williamsburg. I am also the president of our Southside Homeowners Association. Our community is a 20, excuse me, 82 uh, two-family homes. The homes were built by HPD to ensure that the people in the community would not be displaced by the biggest rezoning that has taken place in decades. The very tax increases that are proposed in your proposal are going to drive more than 80% of the homeowners out because they're still blue collar workers. Many of the people that own homes and that live in their homes actually have their family members living below them. So they're not making an income from their homes. They're barely getting by. I'm pleading with you guys to please consider the very programs that you put in place within other offices in New York City, like HPD, so that we could actually afford being owners, not be pushed out because taxes are being elevated because of the entire regentrification that has taken place and made the value of our home, which we purchased, the value, the price point of our homes when we purchased it in 2001 was $298,000. We received a grant for around $80,000, give or take, depending on where your home was located. So we actually only spent around $200,000 to purchase these homes. They're now valued at almost $2 million. And the taxes that are associated with that are pushing the people out. Please make sure that while you're looking at these tax uh, programs that you consider, programs such as HPD, and do some type of survey to evaluate, are the original homeowners still there? Out of the 82 homes, there's maybe four or five buildings in our community that were sold for millions of dollars and tax them on their way out, but not tax them while they wanna stay here, while they have families. We can't afford it. I will submit the rest of my testimony in writing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Omar Walker, followed by Rosario Sinisi. Starting time. Uh, looks like Omar Walker had to leave. Um, so we will go to Rosario Sinisi, followed by Lorraine Doyle. Starting time. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, I've lived in my home in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn for the past 33 years. I work as a scenic supervisor for stage productions and I'm a member of the New York State Bar. My concern is that there's no data to quantify the impact of the report's recommendations, particularly on owners of one to three family homes currently in class one. The report doesn't provide the new market value of properties moved from class two to class one. And without that information and specifics on circuit breakers, plus the requirement that the new classes one and two be revenue neutral, that impact can't be calculated. And adoption of the recommendations absent that information could wind up displacing thousands of homeowners and their tenants with communities of color and rapidly appreciating areas hit the hardest. Absent missing data, I calculated a hypothetical tax rate for the new class one using 2020 market value as shown on the finance department website and then applying the revenue neutral mandate on the theory that class two would not be um, hit with a, a lot of increases in tax because there was no uh, indication in the, the uh, report to that effect. What I came out with comparing two houses, the property tax on a Brooklyn house in, it's a two-story Brooklyn house in an appreciating area, would rise from about $6,500 to $30,780 over the five-year phase in, and a property tax on a two-story Staten Island house would rise from $4,700 to about $6,400. Uh, this is due in part to the, um, the requirement for revenue neutrality. 
and how the circuit breakers for undefined low income homeowners would work, nobody knows. Tenants are considered rent burdened if they're paying over 30% of their income on housing, but what about homeowners? If the Brooklyn homeowner above who bought years ago or inherited a house and whose property now has a 2020 market value of $2,250,000 has an income of 100,000, her new property tax would be 30,780 a year prior to circuit breakers, if any. And if you add in more utility costs, you get the total cost of close to 60% of income spent on housing alone. Depending on the missing variables, many homeowners might be forced to sell and their homes could be devalued due to the increased tax burden and the fact that many would be sold simultaneously. Cash buyers already dominate much of the small residential market, so developers and investors such as those apparently supporting the Tenney litigation might be likely buyers of those homes. So I therefore respectfully urge the commission and politicians supporting the report's recommendations to one, provide the public with actual numbers for all the missing variables before suggesting that these recommendations provide a path to equity, and two, then provide all stakeholders with an opportunity for feedback with more than two minutes for oral testimony. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we will hear from uh, Doyle, if I, I, I just wanted to make sure, uh, was that Ms. Doyle? Was that her name? I'm sorry. Ms. Rosario Sinisi. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Sinisi. Uh, if you would, please submit your testimony in writing. Thank I have you. already. It's 17 pages. I sent it in. Thank you. It's all documented from Finance Department and um, the city, um, uh, the Center for the yeah, City. She, you, 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 you did, and it's very useful, and I wanted to thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we will hear from Lorraine Doyle and then go to Omar Walker again. Starting time. on the south side of Williamsburg. I am one of the homeowners that Priscilla Gaznavi has spoken about. And 80% of our homeowners are blue work collar workers. And the property taxes are affordable at the moment. My husband and I occupy one of the apartments and my mother lives in the other apartment. And we would not be able to afford a tax increase as we are getting older and preparing to retire. We were part of the original homeowners that moved here to help provide a stable foundation for the neighborhood two decades ago. At that time, not many people wanted to invest or move here. We made new acquaintances and have grown with the neighborhood. There are great small businesses that have opened, which we frequent with a tax increase that would limit mine and other homeowners from being able to stay for it would price us out. Even though the property values have gone up significantly, most homeowners salaries have not. Due to the pandemic, many have lost tenants or had to carry them to keep their homes. This does not factor in inflation. Also, the public services in the neighborhood have not improved, but declined. For the reasons I asked, the advisory commission to keep the property taxes low for the Southside homeowners in Williamsburg. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Omar Walker, followed by Carlos LeBron. Starting time. Hi, I am not Omar Walker. My name is Claudette Brady, and I am filling in for Omar because he had a work engagement he has to uh, he had to attend. <clears throat> um, we are residents of Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn Community Board Three. Uh, this tax, and I'm, I, I had not written, had not as, had not written a small statement. I've act, I'm actually composing a fairly long um, written statement on this, so I'm kind of winging it here. So the tax, the property tax burden for specifically for people in Bedford Stuyvesant and neighborhoods that have been disenfranchised for years will be significant. Currently, across um, community board three, taxes for homeowners are somewhere between um, eight to five to eight thousand dollars a year. If we change the tax code to market value, we're looking at property taxes going between eighteen thousand to thirty two thousand dollars a year based on the market value of between 1.5 million to 3.5 million. What this does is actually punish people who have been disadvantaged. A lot of bedside homeowners 
are multi-generational homeowners, people who bought their homes when, when those areas were redlining, people whose homes they paid, they had to save money for to pay for, or if they didn't do that, the previous owner held the mortgage and they faced foreclosure for missing one payment. I know people who bought their houses for $30,000 in 1973 with a $25,000 down payment and had a $15,000 mortgage, a $15,000 interest rate and the, um, the bank held, held the note until they paid it off. So changing this tax code right now will again punish people who have been marginalized by the system and who had not had the opportunities given other res other citizens of this country to be homeowners one more time. Thank you for the testimony. Um, we will now hear from Carlos LeBron and then we will see if uh, Councilmember Yeager is available to speak. Starting time. My message here is basically born and raised in Williamsburg. And it's not fair that we stood in this neighborhood when it was at its worst. And now it seems like we may have to leave after so many years being here through bad times. And now it's good and it's truly not fair. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Uh, Council member Colin Yeager, uh, if you're available, we will hear your testimony. All right, well, um, this concludes the public testimony. If we have inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, if that person could raise their hand using the Zoom raise hand function, we will try to hear from you now. Again, if you wish to testify and did not have a chance to do so, please use the raise hand function in the Zoom and we will try to hear from you now. I'd like to say something before uh, we get to that. Uh, I'll use some of Councilman Yeager's time. Uh, first of all, I agree with most of what our public officials have said. Uh, the issue I have is that, uh, particularly when they talk about how, you know, the mayoral uh, term is almost halfway over and we have six months to go and there's a lot of work to be done. And we will, uh, as a commission, uh, dedicate ourselves to putting recommendations into place that hopefully will serve as a blueprint to make the system fairer. What we need from our public officials, and I don't think there's a lot of disagreement on, on many of the inequities. There may some, be some uh, problems in the details, but they need to put pressure on their colleagues, on the people who are running for citywide office. There are candidates running for mayor in both parties right now. There are candidates running for the city council. Uh, next year, there'll be candidates running for the state legislature to support an equitable tax program. And they need to hold the feet to the fire of the people who want to serve the city uh, at large. Uh, you know, we, we can provide uh, a blueprint, but we're not going to exist unless the next mayor wants us to exist beyond this. And we need the public officials uh, who have testified and who realize that this is a problem to uh, drive the point home. So, uh, so those are my comments. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, Chair Shaw, it appears no other members of the public would like to testify. So we're done with the public portion, public testimony portion of this uh, hearing. All right, <clears throat> so thank you very much, Amr. Um, for starters, I'd like to thank all the members of the public and elected officials who joined us tonight to give feedback on the commission's preliminary report. Your comments are important as the commission develops its final recommendations. In the interest of time, you know, we've tried to limit any individual responses to some of the questions, but we have been listening and, you know, can we, Ralph and others raised, you know, the simple, fact that we need to have examples of 
individual properties and we will obviously take that into account and um you know as, as we still need to do a lot of work on both the circuit breakers and the residential abatement programs um so we, we are listening and we hear your concerns and it's really important as we continue to do our deliberations as a reminder the commission will be holding virtual hearings in queens on june 9th in the bronx on june 14th and in manhattan on june 16th the staten island virtual hearing has already occurred on May 11th, as we mentioned. Members of the public may attend any hearing regardless of their home borough. If you wish to testify, you must register on the Advisory Commission's website at least 24 hours prior to the start of the hearings. Also, for members of the public who are listening who'd like to submit written testimony, you may do so at any time. To register to testify or submit written testimony, please visit the Commission's website at nyc.gov slash property tax reform, one word. Finally, I would like to thank the commission members who are putting in their time um, tonight, especially um, this, well, and especially the staffs of the city council and the mayor's office for making this hearing possible because we couldn't have done it without you. And I, I thank everybody that's been involved and um, I, I'd like to just open it up for any other commissioners that want to say any concluding remarks before we um, end the hearing tonight. Hearing none, we will see you at our next hearing on June 9th in Queens. Thank you very much, everybody.